Hey Lighthouse, my name is Josh Yang and I'm the Youth Deacon here at ACC. I hope everyone was able to stay warm last week with the freezing temperatures and that things are relatively back to normal now, uh, or at least as normal as possible while we're still dealing with COVID. For Joanna and I personally, we were grateful to stay a few nights with some friends while the roads were frozen over and it wasn't safe to drive. Uh, and then once we were able to get home, we were also grateful to be able to host a couple of friends who didn't have water or heat in their apartment. Uh, I know there are a lot of people whose homes have busted pipes or have water damage, and if this is you or your family, uh, please reach out to me, to Dom, or to any of the pastors at ACC. We want to make sure that people are taken care of and that ACC can be a resource for those that need the help. A few weeks ago, Dom kicked off a new series on Genesis where we looked at how the book as a whole charts the course of the entire Bible, um, from God to man and from sin to redemption. Specifically in Genesis 1, we looked at the creation story, and Dom covered how God formed the entire world as we know it, and then rested on the seventh day. This week we'll look at Genesis 2, which gives a complementary account of the creation story and elaborates specifically on the creation of man. If we're not careful though, uh, it might be easy to think that the creation accounts in Genesis 1 and 2 contradict each other, but that's definitely not the case. For example, let's read verses 4 to 7 together. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord made earth and heaven. Now no shrub of the field was yet on earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living person. Chapter 2 gives a more logical progression rather than the sequential one found in chapter 1. But ultimately, Moses expands on the creation of man as God's ultimate and most intimate creation. A couple weeks ago, Dom covered the concept of Imago Dei, this idea that every human is intrinsically given value because we're created in the image of God. Verse 7 expands on this concept. It says, God took the care to form man out of the dust in the ground rather than simply speaking man into existence. Uh, but then he takes it one step further and he breathes life into his creation. The word that's used to describe a living person comes from the same word that's used to describe a person's soul. Now, this is what many biblical scholars point to uh, when they talk about what sets humans apart from other living beings, right? It's not just our ability to reason or our morality, but this concept of a soul that was breathed into us by God himself. Hopefully we see that these aren't contradictory creation accounts, uh, but instead chapter two elaborates on a specific aspect of the creation story and emphasizes the personal nature of God creating us. Now, there's a lot to cover in this chapter, uh, but today we're going to focus on, on two main concepts, both of which ultimately relate to uh, our worship of God. First, that work was an essential part of humanity before sin entered the world. And second, that all people were created with a need to be in community. Uh, for our first point, let's start by defining what exactly we mean by work. And so when God created Adam, there were two main tasks that he was given. In verse 15, it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and tend it. And later in verse 19, that God brought every animal to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. So we see that before sin entered the world, man was given a couple of jobs to do. One physical and one mental or creative. So work in the garden and name all the animals. Also notice that there was no concept of money or any sort of monetary reward, right? Adam wasn't doing this work simply to get paid, but both the physical work and the creative work were meant to fulfill a need within him and to make him productive. In other words, the work itself had meaning, and it wasn't just a means to an end. Right? To bring this back to our first main point, Adam's work involved using the physical and mental gifts that God had given him, and it was part of his worship back to God. So how do we apply this idea of work to our lives now? Well, I'm sure there are a few things uh, that a lot of us default to when we hear the word work. For example, we're probably all familiar with the concept of having a job that pays you a salary for doing a task. Or if you're old enough, you might have even had a part-time job yourself. Another version of work is being a full-time stay-at-home parent. 
or you may have heard that uh, your main job right now is to be a student and that whenever the Bible talks about work, uh, that you can apply those ideas to your schoolwork. And while all of those things are, are definitely true, uh, I'd like to challenge us to expand our definition of work to include anything that uses our physical or mental talents and passions in a way that's productive for society and or in a way that furthers the kingdom of God. Now, early last week uh, when the storm hit and the power was out and the roads were too icy to drive, you know, it was really hard to do work in the traditional sense of doing our jobs. You know, there wasn't really any snow yet either, so we couldn't even go outside and like have fun or do any of that. Uh, it was really hard to feel productive, and the day kind of just seemed to drag on. I mean, at a certain point, I think the most enjoyable thing we did was cook lunch together and then clear some snow out of the driveway. You know, not having work or not having school definitely sounds like fun, and it's true, you know, we definitely all need a break from time to time. But having nothing to focus our efforts on or nothing to make us productive ends up making the day feel really unfulfilling. And I think that's because doing work and being productive was always meant to bring us that fulfillment. And because of sin though, you know, work can be hard. And not just in the sense that school can be stressful or that a job can be tedious, um, but that even if a job is aligned with our passions and our talents, it's not always fulfilling. Now, some people view their jobs or their schools simply as a mission field and that the work itself is some type of necessary evil. Or some people think that in heaven, you know, we won't have to do any kind of work at all, that we just sit around all day, you know, watch TV, play games. And I think this passage in Genesis 2 shows us that we'll still have work to do, even in heaven. Um, but our work then will be a redeemed version of our work now. And it'll fulfill us in a way that God originally intended so that we can worship him fully. Our second main idea is that all people were created with a need to be in community. In verse 18, God looks at Adam doing his work alone and concludes, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now it's important to remember again that at this point of creation, sin hadn't entered the world yet. So it wasn't sinful that Adam was alone, uh, but God saw that something was incomplete with Adam being alone. So then God went through all the animals in verse 20, looking for a suitable helper for Adam, uh, but he didn't find one that made sense. Adam had you know, his personal relationship with God. He had the work that he was assigned to do in the garden, uh, but God knew that Adam needed a community to share these things with, or else it would ultimately still be incomplete. Now, we've been in quarantine for almost a year now, um, and it's crazy to think about how much has happened since things shut down last March. Personally, I've had several big life changes, and there have been a lot of different ups and downs. A few of my favorite things to do before COVID were exploring new restaurants around town, uh, going to the theater to watch a movie, or going to the gym to unwind after a long day. And it's crazy to think that we haven't really been able to do any of those things for an entire year. However, you know, the hardest part for me about this past year has definitely been how much our sense of community has changed. Uh, I miss meeting up with people and just being able to hang out without having to be extra careful. You know, I miss the in-between moments when nothing was really happening, but you could run into someone and you haven't talked to them in a while and you can just spontaneously catch up really quick. You know, I miss being able to worship side by side with people to experience, you know, that shared emotion that you have to be in the room in order to really feel. And from reading through your survey responses, I know a bunch of us are feeling the same way when it comes to missing our in-person community. You know, as good as technology has gotten, I think most of us agree that a Zoom call can't fully replace the real thing or that watching a video online makes it way harder to pay attention as opposed to you know, listening to a person speak right in front of you. And personally, I miss being able to teach in person and to see people's faces and reactions. Uh, it's been so long though that you know, all of this almost feels normal now. Uh, but just because it feels normal doesn't mean it's okay. And, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. You know, I think what this passage shows is that there are parts of our worship that were always meant to be done in community, and it'll always be slightly incomplete if we're doing it on our own. And it's been a hard year in a lot of different ways, and the lack of community for a lot of us has definitely made it all just a little bit harder. Um, 
but we've been feeling the effects of it for a while now, and I think our passage today speaks a bit as to why it's been so tough. You know, we were meant to worship in community, and I can't wait for that to happen again soon. So like we said in the beginning of the lesson, these first few chapters of Genesis all have a lot of big ideas in them, and we've only begun to cover a couple of them in terms of work and community. So to recap, we saw that work was an essential part of God's design to bring us fulfillment before sin entered the world, and that we were all created with a need to worship together in community. We have some questions for y'all to discuss in your small groups to explore these topics a bit more, and Dominic will wrap up chapter two next week, so I hope you'll join us for that as well. So stay tuned for some announcements, and I hope that you have a good time and discussion in your small groups. We have a survey we would love for all of Lighthouse to fill out. You can find the survey by going to acc.church slash lighthouse21 survey. We want to know how you're doing, what you're up to, and how we can better serve you. Now, we've got prizes for you. Yup, you've heard me right, prizes. So it's in your best interest to fill out the survey. We've got an amazing prize pack for the grand prize winner. We've got snacks, drinks, instant noodles, candy, Muji pens, a Sanex face mask, a Korean uh, face mask, a boba plushie, and more. This prize pack is gonna be stuffed full. Our second and third prize winners will also win gift cards. I hope you all complete the survey. Now, in the survey is an optional question for you to share your best idea for a future Lighthouse teaching series. The criteria for this winner will be based upon originality, relevance, and connecting to the distinct emphasis we place on Friday lessons, which is about showing you how faith and everyday life intersect with one another, and Sunday lessons, which is about teaching you the Bible and theology for the teaching series. And the winner for this question will not will win not just one squash mallow, but two squash mallows. I can't wait to see your ideas. Mm-hmm.